I think that Edwards could uh, could start his presentation, and I see it's uh, it's daylight now uh, where yes. you are. <laughs> yes, the sun has come up. So okay. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Mark, for uh, inviting me to do this, and uh, hopefully, um, what I have to say will be useful to kind of stimulate some closing discussion because I'm going to talk at a fairly high level um, of, about some principles that I think could be useful for guiding our discussion about about trust and trustable computing. I guess the thing I'd like to start with is that, I mean, trust fundamentally is a social and human property, not an engineering property, really. What we can do as engineers is really build assurance about systems. And if our implementations are actually faithful to our assurance models, then, you know, trust is a potentially natural outcome of that. I'd like to start by pointing out that it's easy to oversimplify the problem and to say, well, you know, in order for a system to be trustworthy, it just has to be verified or, it, or it, we have to have a sufficiently detailed model uh, that covers all the aspects of interest or it has to be uh, secure against intruders. I think these are really oversimplifications of the problem and I think probably everyone here recognizes that. So what I'd like to do is outline four principles and I'll start with one that I learned from Herman Kopetz and I, I call it the Kopetz principle simply because I learned it from him but it's uh, I don't think he invented this he just uh, was the first person to clearly articulate it to me but he said to me that many of the properties that we assert about systems like uh, safety determinism timeliness reliability that these are actually not properties of the system but rather properties of a model of the system and I think that this is a, a really key point. We can build assurance, but when we build assurance, we're, we're building assurance on models, not on systems. The extent to which those models are faithful to the system is, of course, the way that you build trust, right? I mean, if you have, if you have a formally verified model, for example, and the properties that you've verified are actually reflected with high fidelity in the realized system, then it's possible that the formal verification will contribute to the trustworthiness of the system. But ultimately, the assurance that you provide is really about the models and not about the system itself. The fact is that every system that we build can fail in unexpected ways that are not reflected at all in the models that we, uh, that we have constructed. And that's, that's a simple reality. And so um, we have to recognize it. So, so the issue here is that when we focus on models, of course, what I mean by models here is, is really very broad. I mean, many people will immediately think that, well, all right, we're talking about UML models or, or uh, Simulink models or something like that. But that's not really what I mean. I, I, what I mean by a model is any description of a system that is not the thing in itself. So this, concept of the thing in itself, right, is the thing in itself is the aircraft. The software that runs in the microprocessors is actually, in this sense, a model. It's a description of how you would like the electrons to slosh around in silicon in order to control the aircraft. And it, the thing in itself is ultimately the microprocessor that is has these electrons sloshing around in it. And the, the model is simply our you know, our, our engineered design. So any description of the system that is not the thing in itself, I'm, I'm calling a model here. So the issue here is that people often confuse the map and the territory. Uh, Solomon Gulam had a very nice way of expressing this where he said, you will never strike oil by drilling through the map. And, you know, I encounter this all the time with software engineers. They, they say, for example, when they've constructed a C program to run on a microcontroller, that the program is the realization. But the program isn't the realization. The realization is the microprocessor executing that program. And the fact is that the microprocessor executing that program is going to have properties that the program doesn't have. If the program is written in C, one of the properties that the execution has that is not a property of the C program is timing. C, in all its glory, does not express timing. 
this is also true of Rust. This is also true of Java. This is true, in fact, of every widely used programming language today. Timing is an emergent property that, that arises from the execution and is not actually a property of the program itself. So the third principle that I'd like to talk about is that there's actually more than one way that models are used. And I've identified two very different uses of models that often get confused with one another. So I call these a scientific use of models and an engineering use of models, but you know that those terms are, are a bit of an oversimplification because every engineer uses models in scientific ways and, and, and every scientist uses in, uh, models in an engineering way as well. But there are two very distinct uses of models and people tend to confuse them. So the first use is what I call the scientific model. And in, in that usage, uh, the value of a model lies in how well its behavior matches that of a physical system. So if you construct a model, I mean, this is what a scientist does. Given a physical system, you try to construct a model of that physical system, and the value of that model is contingent on the accuracy with which the model describes the physical system. So if there's a mismatch between the model and the physical system, in, in science, it's the model that's at fault, not the physical system. But in engineering, we actually have a very different use of models. In engineering, the value of a physical system lies in how well its behavior matches that of a model. So if I give you a VHDL program, for example, as a model, and I give you a piece of silicon that doesn't do what the VHDL program says it should do, the piece of silicon is junk. There may be nothing wrong with the model, but the, the piece of silicon that fails to realize the circuit described in that VHDL program is flawed. So these are almost mirror image uses of models. And uh, you know, one way to think about it is that a, you know, a scientist asks, can I make a model for this thing? And an engineer asks, can I make a thing for this model? Now, in practice, I do a lot of work in real-time systems. And a very clear articulation of where I think we've gone wrong in real-time systems is that we're overusing scientific models and not using engineering models enough. So currently, if you want to analyze the timing of software, which you need to do for many cyber physical system designs because the software has to interact with the physical world and timing matters, then you might try, and in fact, what people tend to do today is they construct scientific models of the microprocessor as if the microprocessor were an artifact found in nature and the models have to be incredibly detailed. And they often have to include things that are not in the documentation. Uh, you can have bugs in the model because properties that affect timing in the, in, are realized in silicon, but not documented in the spec sheets for the, for the, uh, for the particular chip. So this is an example where th this use of scientific modeling leads to a, a very in unnecessarily hard approach to the problem of designing uh, repeatable and predictable real-time systems. So the worst case execution time problem in practice is an extremely hard problem because it's trying to construct scientific models of systems that were not designed for controlling timing. There's an alternative approach, which uh, Jan Reinecke alluded to when he talked kicking off this meeting uh, that we've explored, which is to actually change the way we design microprocessors. So the, the, the idea there is simply to give the software control over timing so that software can in fact specify timing at a, sufficiently, at a sufficient level of granularity to be able to get control over the timing enough that you can in fact use an engineering style of design where your program actually specifies the timing and then it's up to the physical realization to meet that timing. So we, we set out with this uh, prep machine project to demonstrate that this could be done without sacrificing performance. And I think that we have successfully demonstrated that. Our latest generation of prep machines is in fact a RISC-V uh, that gives you extremely tight control over timing and demonstrably is competitive in, in performance with uh, any RISC-V uh, architecture that you would find out there. So 
this is an, an example of where, in a sense, we can change the problem. Instead of trying to construct detailed models of microprocessors as they exist, we try to construct microprocessors that will exhibit the behaviors that our models say are the behaviors that we require. So one way to think about this, of course, is that all models are wrong. This was famously said by George Box way back when, right? There's always a mismatch between the model and the physical realization. But Box said, you know, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I realized after thinking about this for quite a long time that this is a statement about scientific models because the statement that the model is wrong because it's mismatched is it implies that it's incumbent on the model to match the physical system. But there's a corresponding statement in engineering, which is that essentially all system implementations are wrong, but some are useful. Every realization of a system that we build has flaws and it will, in the field, under certain circumstances, exhibit behaviors that we did not expect. There is, it, it's simply impossible to design engineering systems that do not have that property. But if those malfunctions of the system are sufficiently rare, the, the physical realization, despite being wrong, uh, is nevertheless useful. So one way to think about this is that we can relate models and things. And this picture is obviously a gross oversimplification of the world because it puts science, engineering, and mathematics all in one slide in the context of engineered systems. But at the bottom level, we have the physical realizations, the thing in itself, the airplane, uh, the, the microprocessors on the airplane with silicon sloshing in them and interfacing over networks. We have scientific models of those things which are uh, where it's incumbent on the model to match the physical thing. But we also have engineering models where it's incumbent on the physical thing that gets deployed to match the model. And these are mirror images of one another. Now, when we look at questions like formal verification, formal verification is about relationships between models. It is not about relationships between models and things. So we use mathematics, in fact, in fact, in general, mathematics is about relationships between models. And we talk about abstraction and refinement as ways of managing verification. So for example, you could have uh, a thing which is what you want, uh, uh, an airplane that is safe. You have your design, which is a model. The validation question is a question of whether the model is faithful to the thing. And it, it, it could be not faithful because the model is flawed, or it could be not faithful because the thing is flawed. But both of those are possibilities. And in order to build trust, we're going to want models that we are able to verify, and we're going to want faithful realizations of those models. So when we look at formal verification, we will often relate requirements, which are also formal models, to designs, which are themselves as well formal models. And the relationship between those models is essentially a mathematical relationship. So verification is the question of whether the requirement is a sound abstraction of the design. And that's what a formal verification tool like a model checking tool will uh, determine for you. And to the extent that that can give you trust, well, that depends on another layer, the layer below, which is the faithfulness relationship between the thing and the model. So in, if we look at the cyber physical system context, which is where all of my work is, one of the interesting things about this is that we have very trustable models for each of the pieces of these systems. So the fact that all of the world's banking is done on computers, that fact relies on a, a, a tremendous level of trust in the ability that computers have to reliably transform data. Right? We don't even think about having to verify whether the addition of two 32-bit numbers occurred correctly. Right? When you're designing an aircraft control system, that's not part of your verification question because we've figured out how to make computers that do that extremely reliably. What we haven't done is figured out how to build systems that compose these heterogeneous components in order to, in, in order to build the same level of trust. So one of, the, one of the key properties that makes computers particularly useful for banking is the determinism 
of any single threaded imperative programming language. The, a, a program in a single threaded imperative language is a deterministic model. Uh, the underlying system isn't deterministic, it's electrons sloshing around in silicon, right? It's a, it's a highly non-deterministic system, but the model itself is, is extremely deterministic and we wouldn't be doing our banking on these computational platforms if it weren't deterministic, right? If the addition of two 32-bit numbers sometimes came out one way and sometimes came out another way in the model, then I don't think we would be uh, trusting these, uh, these systems to do our banking. So the fact is that we have very good, very useful deterministic models for computational platforms. We have very useful deterministic models for networks. We have very useful deterministic models for physical plants. Any ordinary differential equation model of some physical plant is a deterministic model of that physical plant. As soon as we put these models together, however, we get highly non-deterministic models. We lose that very essential property that has been central to building trust in each of the components when we compose these components. So if you look at a cyber-physical system design, uh, what are the kinds of questions that we want to be able to answer in order to build trust? You've got, you've got some sensors that are stimulating computation. You've got some actuators that are driving the physical world. We may be interested in what combinations of periodic and sporadic event generators from the sensors are manageable. So if we have, for example, a sensor that is um, sporadically triggering, what kinds of malfunctions will actually cause disruptions downstream in the system? How do execution times affect the feasibility of systems? How will, how will, they, how will the execution times uh, disrupt the behavior that we expect? How do we get repeatable and testable behavior even when the communication is across networks? And how do we specify and ensure and enforce deadlines? These are essentially timing properties and we're trying to specify these in languages that do not express timing properties. So, the strategy that we have at Berkeley for addressing this problem is to find engineering models. Specifically, we're interested in engineering models where the timing is actually part of the model rather than an emergent property of the realization. But of course, we need these models to be able to translate into efficient and faithful realizations. And we need to be able to perform verification on them. And we need to be able to design interesting and useful systems. If any one of these three bullets is missing, we don't have an interesting solution. So the approach that we're taking to that right now, the focus of, of my own research group is on this uh, sort of meta language. It's a polyglot language. We're not, tr we're not trying to replace programming languages like Rust and C and so forth. In fact, this is a language that's designed as a component to build component architectures in an actor oriented style but it's actors revisited. It's a model of computation that we call reactors, and it's very explicit about timing properties, and it's much more deterministic than actors. And the actual functionality of your programs can be written in C, in C++, and in TypeScript today, and we have plans for supporting uh, Rust and Python. So in conclusion, the four points that I tried to make is really that assurance, which is necessary for trust, Assurance is what we can do with, uh, with engineering models, and it's about models. It's not about the things. We have to keep the map and the territory distinct. We have to understand when we're talking about the model and when we're talking about the thing in itself. Engineering models differ from scientific ones. The role that they play in building assurance and building trust are, are different. And we need deterministic models for cyber-physical systems. So one way to think about this is perhaps we should be making things more faithful to models in which we have confidence rather than trying to build confidence in things we have made. Thanks.